In today's video, what we're going to be taking a look at is descriptive statistics. Altogether, we're going to be taking a look at about 16 different formulas, uh, 16 different functions. Now, you won't need to memorize these. You can, uh, I'd recommend you write these down. You have a little uh, formula sheet going in order to refer back to these. Half of them, maybe a bit over half of them, should be review from prior math courses that you've taken before. But just the same, we'll spend a decent amount of time going through each one. We'll have a large working example that we can have to kind of work through how we calculate all of these, adding on, adding on as we go through. And then we'll take all this and we'll link it right back to our data visualization to kind of see how it all fits together. So that being said, expect a whole bunch of math. Um, probably have a calculator ready. Try to follow along with our examples. Uh, I'd highly recommend too. Take a look at me doing the example. Stop the video. Back it up. Take a look at the data set again, and then see if you can work through it on your own. Uh, being able to calculate these is going to be a pretty fundamental part, a pretty large part of this course altogether. So let's take a look at that. So today we're going to be taking a look at a few different um, genres of descriptive statistics, if you were. We're going to start off taking a look at descriptive uh, statistics that explain measures of location. And we'll kind of lump this together, location and position. So let's kind of give this some context before we start off. Let's presume that we have our number line here. So there's our number line. There is our x variable. Maybe this is age. Maybe this is just a different x variable altogether. Keep in mind that this number line, right, in all technicality, will run off from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. And we'll typically just be dealing with a small subset of all of the possible numbers along this. One of the things we're going to be looking at is, okay, say we have our ages here. Uh, we're not actually getting into the data visualization of this yet, but let's just presume, again, not necessarily this data set, but let's presume we have a distribution of ages that looks something like this. So we'd call this roughly a normal distribution if I drew it half decent. And what we'd be looking at is how these ages are distributed along the number line. These measures of location or measures of position, the first few descriptive statistics we're going to look at, kind of tell us, okay, here's our distribution of interest. Where is it located? What is its position on the number line? So things we're going to look at in this first section. We're going to look at concepts of percentiles. This is where we'll start off, looking at percentiles. Uh, attached to percentiles is this concept of the median. After uh, the median, um, and also attached to percentiles would be quartiles. That's just a special kind of version of our percentile. We'll then take a look at the mean. Uh, the mode. We'll also take a look at a geometric mean. So that is when we typically talk about the mean, that is your average, right? Mean is your average. We're typically referring to an arithmetic average. Well, we'll also take a look at a geometric average or a geometric mean and what that, uh, what that works out to be as well. From here, we're then gonna move on to measures of dispersion. So for our measures of dispersion, what do we have here? Well, let's presume that day, okay, we know our distribution that we've just visualized here is centered about right where I've drawn the line. Our dispersion then is saying, well, okay, if this is where we're centered, this is where we're located, well, how dispersed is the data? On this number line, is the data fairly tightly packed to this central point, or is our data really, really spread out? And we'll look at a lot of different ways to measure this. Uh, some of these ways to measure it is going to be using our, well, we'll introduce it as a concept. We won't really use it too much. First one is going to be looking at our mean absolute deviation. So mean absolute deviation, we'll take a look at that first just to kind of give an idea of the concept. Not really a concept we'll carry forward through the course. Big ones we will carry forward through the course is going to be our standard deviation. This is going to be the big one that we really utilize as we go forward. And then from this, we're going to look at two kind of uh, concepts we can apply to our standard deviation. And this is going to be our Chebyshev's theorem and our empirical rule. Um, let's erase that. That's not how you write an M. 
our empirical rule. Empirical rule. And these two here just have a bit of information for us to determine. Okay, given some location, given some standard deviation, we can then determine a proportion of observations, right? Observations that are going to fall within so many standard deviations of this central point. And again, you're like, yeah, what? Don't don't worry, right? This is just kind of the introduction, what we're expecting to get up, in, uh, what we're going to be looking at. Don't get too caught up with these just yet. Once we get through all of this, we're then going to go through an example, right? So all of these, we're going to just utilize this data set. We're just going to keep calculating more and more descriptive statistics, get an idea as to what's going on with it. Once we've done all that, we'll visualize this data set with a histogram. And then part of creating a histogram is creating a frequency table. We're going to wave our hands and we're going to say, hey, what if we didn't have this raw data? What if we didn't have these six observations, but rather we only had that frequency table? Could we still figure out some of these descriptive statistics, some of these measures of location position, some of these measures of dispersion? And we'll take a look at how we can get an estimate of those if that was the case. So let's take a look at that. Let's erase some of this stuff here and make some room. Okay, so our data set that we're working with to start off is our age, presumably in years, I'm presuming this is not months, and we just have a sample of ages here. Um, sometimes as we go through this, we're going to presume this is a sample. Sometimes we're going to presume it's a population, depending on what our need is for it. Uh, in this case here, one of the first questions that we kind of want to kind of think about, going all the way back to where we started off, is, well, what do we have here? Is this qualitative or quantitative data? Okay, so hopefully you figured out in that that this is actually quantitative data. We're measuring a quantity, the number of years. The follow-up question then is what level of measurement do we have? Keeping in mind our levels of measurement, we have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Noir is uh, one way that you can help remember that. And so our nominal, these were things like colors, Ordinal, we have order, but that's all we have. We can say that, hey, this observation is bigger than that observation, but we can't really say how much bigger or how much better. We are going to have our interval, where now we have fixed intervals between them, but we're not necessarily starting at zero. Or that is, if we do have zero, zero doesn't necessarily mean the absence of a condition. And finally, we have ratio. Ratio level data, okay, we have order, 25 is bigger than 20, uh, 10 is bigger than 5. We have intervals, meaning that the difference between 5 and 6 is the same as the difference between 10 and 11. And what ratio means is that, hey, 10 is actually twice as big as 5. It's actually twice as much of something. Somebody who's 10 years old has been alive for twice as long as somebody who's 5 years old. So what level of measurement do we have? Well, in this case here, we have ratio level of measurement. So again, just carrying that forward from our previous bit, bit of an important thing to be able to differentiate qualitative, quantitative data, and in order to determine our level of measurement. Okay, let's take a look at our first, uh, at our first measurement of location then. So our first one we're going to look at then is this idea of a percentile. And what a percentile is, is saying, okay, we're going to have some observation such that some percent of our observation is smaller than it. So, for example, if we were to take a look at the 50th percentile, that would be saying that 50% of observations are smaller than whatever number we assign to that 50th percentile. And hey, if 50% of observations are smaller, well then 50% are bigger, right? Very similarly, we could take a look at the 25th percentile, such that again, hey, 25% of observations are gonna be smaller than this value. And then if 25% are smaller, 75% are gonna be larger than. We can also do funny ones, right? We could do something weird, like we could take a look at the 67th percentile, on and on and on and on. Again, 67th, okay, 67% smaller than this value, leaving, what, 33% being larger than. 
Uh, we have also other names too. We have uh, deciles, and we would have our first, second, third, fourth, tenth decile. And what a decile is, is going to be our 10th percentile, 20th percentile, 30th percentile, on and on and on, right? Such that this would be our first decile, second decile, third decile. Additionally, four tiles, again, just a way that we can save instead of saying, hey, the 25th percentile, we can say that our 25th percentile is our first quartile. Our 50th percentile is our second quartile. And then finally, our 75th percentile is going to be our third quartile. So again, different ways that we can refer to percentiles, percentiles, deciles, quartiles, all getting at the same idea, just different ways that we can break it up. So how do we go about actually solving for this? First step is to organize our data. So let's just write that down. Organize our data. This is the most crucial fundamental step and one that's often missed. What we want to do is we want to organize or sort our data from our smallest to our largest value. And when we do this by hand, it's quite tedious, right? This can actually take a little bit of time to go through depending on the size of your data set. This won't be too bad. Um, we'll take a look later how to do this with software package and it's really, really easy in that case. So let's take a look. We have our ages, right? This is our X variable of interest. And we want to organize these from smallest to largest. So looking at it, I have two at 22. Those seem to be my two smallest guys there. Okay, so 22, 22. My next one is 24. After 24, what do I have? 28. Carrying on, 37 and 42. 37 and 42. Okay, what can be helpful is to kind of then think about, and this also helps us to make sure I have enough. What do I have for observation? Observation 1, observation 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So I have six observations, what do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so I have them all accounted for. Now that we have our data sorted from smallest to largest value, what we wanna do is we wanna find the location of our percentile of interest. So let's presume, let's say we wanted to find, uh, because it's gonna be a common one, let's suppose we're trying to find our 25th percentile. Keep in mind that's the same thing as saying we're trying to find our first quartile. Okay, so 25% of our observations are going to be smaller than some value. 75% are going to be larger than some value. Tricky part with this is that this percentile or quartile or decile, it does not actually have to be a complete observation. Sometimes, and actually frequently, these take place in between observations. And so we'll take a look at how exactly we get that when that's the case. So, okay, let's introduce our location formula. So our location formula is location of our percentile is gonna be equal to n plus one. So n is our sample size or population, how many observations we have. n plus one times P over 100. So P being the percentile of interest over 100. So let's, let's work this out in our example here. So we're looking for the 25th percentile. So we're looking for the location of the 25th percentile. And that's gonna be six plus one times 25 over 100. So what's that gonna be? That's gonna be seven times 0.25 that's going to give me a location of my 25th percentile as 1.75. Okay, so we have this value here. Keep in mind what this is, this is a location. This is not a percentile. 
This is where we would look to find our percentile, right? So this is all that this is done. This is just giving us a location. And really emphasize that because often I'll say, hey, what's the 25th percentile? And I'll get this location of the 25th percentile appearing as the answer. And that's, that's incorrect. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for location 1.75. So here is observation one, here is observation two. We're looking for observation 1.75. So kind of right in between the two. Now in this case, in this case it's pretty obvious. Hey, location one is 22, location two is 22. Well, if we try to do a weighted average between these two, the weighted average is gonna be 22. So, okay, we're good in that case there, we can work it out. But what if it wasn't so, what if it wasn't so straightforward? Well, if it wasn't so straightforward, we would have to then go through and grab a, uh, or another formula, being our kind of value formula or weighted average in order to determine, hey, where is our actual percentile? And in order to see that, let's work out yet another quartile, and just so we aren't playing with two of the same number. That is, in this case here, let's go take a look at location of our 75th percentile. So location of 75. Again, that's going to be n plus 1, so 6 plus 1, times 75 over 100. And so in that case there, I'm going to have 7 times 0.75 is going to work out to be a location of our 75th percentile of 5.25. So again, we have observation 5, we have observation 6. We're saying, hey, our 75th percentile is going to be found right in between the two, but closer to 5. So let's take a look at what that formula is. Let's take a look at how we can find out what the actual value of our percentile is. Okay, so our value is going to be equal to the value of the first observation that we have. And I'll come back and talk about what I mean by this notation in a second times 1 minus our weight plus the value of p plus 1 times our weight. And okay, let's, let's take a look at what I mean by this. So if we go back to our location formula, we had a location of 5.25. So if we break this apart, what I have in this notation here is that 5 would be our p, right? So this here, that would be p. And this 0 0.25, that would be my weight. So if I wanted to work out what my actual value was, I would say, okay, what is the value of my fifth observation, right? p, 5. So I would say, okay, 37. So I'd have 37 there times 1 minus my weight. My weight is going to be this 0 0.25. So 1 minus 0 0.25 plus the value of p plus 1. So that's the value of my sixth observation. So that's going to be 42. And then again times my weight. So I'm not 1 minus weight, just times my weight in this case here. Okay. So now we have our formula. If we go through and solve this, we are going to get our value, and this is going to be the value of the 75th percentile. And let's just stop and actually think about what this math is actually doing. This often helps to clear it up for those of you who are maybe a little bit more mathematically inclined. So if we take a look at where we expected the 75th percentile to be, we expected the 75th percentile to be a location 5.25. That is, we expect it to be closer to 5 than we expect it to be to 6. So our value that we calculate, we expect to be closer to 37 than to 42. So when we're working through this, we're saying, okay, what's the value of our fifth observation times 1 minus our weight? Well, by doing 1 minus this weight here, we get 0 0.75, right? That was 37 0 0.75 that is what we're saying is hey we're putting more of the weight this and this make up a hundred percent 
we're putting more of this weight on the smaller number because we expect our value to be closer to this guy. Then plus our next observation and just a little bit of our weight. So if we work that out, well, what do we end up getting? 37 times 0.75, that's going to be 27.75. And 42 times 0.25, well, that's going to work out to be 10.5. So if we add those two together, we are going to get 38.25. And this value here, this 38.25, this is the value of our 75th percentile of our third quartile. So we could go and say, okay, here we go. Q3, third quartile is 38.25. Again, what does this tell us? Well, this is going to tell us that 75% of our ages are just less than 38.25 years old. If 75% are smaller than this, it's going to mean that 25% are larger than this value. If we fill this out, we can similarly work out, okay, quartile one is 22. I'll let you go through the math to double check that, but hopefully that is pretty clear. And then quartile two, this is our 50th percentile. Well, our 50th percentile in this case is going to be 26. And again, I'll let you go through the math. I'll let you double check that. Same formula going on here and see if you can confirm that 26 is actually our 50th percentile, our second quartile. So three quartiles going on. We have for our second quartile, this 50th percentile right here. We have yet another name for this guy because it turns out to be a pretty important value. We also call this guy here our median. And the median, all this means is just our middle. This is our middle value. In terms of all of our data, 26 is right smack dab in the middle. Half of our observations are smaller than 26. Half of our observations are bigger than 26. So again, going through this percentile, first thing to do, sort your data, small to large. Second thing, utilize your location formula to find the location of your data, right? This is not the percentile itself. This is just the location of the percentile where you're going to look for it. If this comes back as a whole number, right, and it will from time to time, if this came back as, hey, location of 30 was 2, great, you would just say, oh, 22, have my answer. But, well, more often than not, it's going to be something like this, 1.75, 5.25. That is, our actual percentile is split between two locations, split between two observations. Well, in that case, you're going to have to use this weighted average formula here in order to determine what the actual value of our percentile is, right? And again, what this is, is okay, the value of our actual percentile is gonna be the value of the first observation. So in this case, five, or up here, one, times one minus our weight. So our weight would be 0.25, or if you're looking at the 25th percentile, our weight would be 0.75, plus value of the next observation, so 75th percentile, value would have been 6. 25th percentile, value would have jumped up to 2. And then times our weight itself, which would have either been this 0.25 or this 0.75. From there, we have all of our numbers. It's just number crunching, just using our calculator. And we get our value of the percentile itself, such that this here is actually our 75th percentile. There we go. And then again, you can work back, see if you can work out our first, second quartiles as well. Again, you're like, wait, no, what was the quartile again? This is our 25th percentile. This is our 50th percentile, meaning quartile three, 75th percentile.
right? So in each case, P would be 25, P would be 50, P would be 75. That's our percentiles. That is our first bit of measures of location. Well, let's carry on and take a look at our next. This is our mean or our arithmetic average, right? So this is one probably not going to be worthwhile to spend much time on this guy. This is just going to be a quick kind of go through because most of you should be good to calculate an average as it is. What we have for an average is we actually have two different notations for this. We have x bar, which is going to be, and we have mu, Greek letter mu, and that is going to be, and you're looking at that and you're like, whoa, wait, Keith, those are almost the same. And what are all these weird squiggles and everything like that going on? Okay, let's, let's talk about each one. So the one on our left, x bar, this is our sample mean. We're going to use this if we're dealing with a sample. The one on our right, this is going to be our population mean. And this is the one we're going to utilize if we're dealing with the entirety of the population. So, okay, first off, x bar, notation for sample, population, that's our notation. Sorry, mu, that's our notation for population. And we'll kind of keep this all the way through. We'll use Greek letters for anything to do with the population, and we'll use our standard alphabet anytime we're dealing with sample. Okay, let's get into the functions themselves. What's going on here? We have this weird little squiggly E. What is, what is this? This here is the capital letter sigma, so capital Greek letter sigma. This just means the summation, right? So that is, I want to sum my values of x, and this i just means my observation number. So observation number one, two, three, four, five, and six. I'm just going to sum all of these values of x, and then I'm going to take that answer, and I'm going to divide it by how many observations I have, right? Little n, sample size. Over on this side, well, again, this is just capital letter sigma. This is, again, just our summation operator, meaning that we're just doing the same thing. We're just summing all of our values of x, 37 plus 24 plus 22, all the way through. And then we're dividing by big N. Big N is our population size. So population size and sample size. And you'll look at that and you'll say, okay, well, hey, Keith, if we're just using this data set and we're just going to wave our hands and sometimes say we're dealing with a sample, sometimes we're going to say we're dealing with a population, are we actually going to get different answers? No, no, no. Actually, if you take a look at this, mathematically, it's the exact same, right? Notation's a little bit different. Little n, big N, x bar, mu. But otherwise, we're going to get the exact same answer whether we use our sample mean or our population mean. The only difference is notational. And so you're like, ha, great, you've just created a whole bunch of extra work for me. I'm just gonna forget about that one and just use the one formula. Why, why bother doing two? Well, okay, okay, don't, don't do that, don't do that. Um, right now, there's no difference between these two. It's just strictly notational. As we move on to some other descriptive statistics, well, some of our other statistics, they utilize our mean, and it's going to be important as to whether or not they utilize the sample mean or the population mean. And that is, it'll be a different formula that we use if we're dealing with a sample versus if we're dealing with a population. And you will actually get different numbers depending on which one you utilize. So yes, okay, our means, our averages, they're the same in this sense here. You need to keep the notation because moving forward, that notational difference is important. Okay, we should be good for this, but let's just quickly calculate our mean just to make sure everybody's good. So what are we gonna have? What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the summation of this column. So if we work that out, we are going to get 175. Right, and again, if these ages are in years, that is 175 years is going to be our total summation of them all. And so let's say if we were dealing with a sample, 
I would have x bar is equal to summation of my x's. So x bar is 175 years all over my sample size of 6. Well, that's unitless. That's just 6. And so if I work that out, 175 divided by 6, that gives me 29.16666. So let's go 29.17. We'll just round that to do to two decimal places because well, that seems reasonable dealing with years. So in this case here, what do I have? From my sample of six people, I could say that the average age within this group is just over 29 years. So average age, just over 29 years. Keep in mind, if I had worked this out using the population mean formula, I would have had the exact same results. So mu would have been 175 years all over 6, giving us 29.17. Again, the only difference in notation would be whether this was our population average or our sample average. That's the only distinction to be had there. So that's our average. Let's talk about some principles of our average, turns out, uh, of our arithmetic average. It turns out there's some uh, principles that are going to be rather important to consider that will kind of carry on with us as we go through the course. Let's just uh, copy these over here. Let's take a look at these principles. So our principles, I can never remember. Is this principles or principles? We'll go principles. Why not? So principles, principles of our arithmetic mean. First one is that every data set that is interval or higher so okay if we go back to our levels of or sorry our yep levels of measurement that is going to be interval or ratio so every data set that has interval or ratio will have a mean what this actually means, again, attached to this, is that you cannot take the average of nominal or ordinal level data, right? And you're like, what? But just think about that, right? Okay, so nominal level data, that is colors. We open up a bag of M&Ms, we dump them out on the table. Could we compute the average color? Red plus red plus blue plus yellow plus green equals... That makes no sense, right? So you cannot calculate the average of a nominal data set. Very similarly, you cannot calculate the average of an ordinal data set. Keep in mind, that doesn't mean people don't try. Uh, there's lots of cases where the ordinal data set, uh, it is added up and they do divide because you have numbers and it seems like, hey, yeah, five is bigger than four. But the problem is with ordinal level data, you don't know how much bigger five is than four. Right? Again, thinking about ordinal level data, this could be our Amazon five-star reviews. Right? How much more is a five-star review versus a four-star review? How much more is a three-star review than a two-star review? Right? They don't go up in this ordinal kind of fashion, so you cannot actually determine the mean of it. Okay, our second principle is yeah, the mean is kind of nice because it uses, I'll say, uses all data points. Right, that is, we use all of our values of x. If we went back up here and took a look, we used all six of our data points in order to calculate the mean. Keep in mind, right, we just took a look at our percentiles and our median. Right, this was another measure of position, our median there, the center of our data set. And, well, those did not use all of our data, right? It only used just perhaps one, or we did the weighted average between two of them. So the arithmetic average uses all of our data points. That's not true of all of our other measures, as we've already seen. Our third principle is that every, again, interval or higher level of data will have a unique mean. That is, you'll have only one value for the mean, and it will be unique. So again, you're like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Again, not necessarily true for all of the descriptive statistics we'll introduce. Some, you might have more than one of that statistic. Or, 
is you can think of the mean as our balancing point. Balancing point of the data. So we'll come back. We'll take a look at that guy in a second. But essentially, where the median was the absolute middle, 50% bigger, 50% smaller, the average, uh, that's not the case. The average is going to be the point where the data is balanced. And we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk and we'll take a look at what we mean by that in a second. Finally, five, our fifth point is that if we were to take the sum of every observation from and I'm just going to use the sample mean there, but the same is true if we went like this. Sum of every observation from the population mean, this sum will equal zero. This here is a big principle. Again, this is a big one that we'll want to keep referring back to. And this is actually a good way if you're like, oh, did I actually do this right? Did I add up all my numbers? This is a good way to double check, to say, okay, if I go... This value, this observation minus my mean, this observation minus my mean, on and on and on and on. And then once I calculate all these differences, if I take the summation of them, do I get zero? Or right if you're doing this by hand, approximately zero depending on your rounding. This is a principle, this will hold. This is a big, big one that we'll utilize as we carry it forward. But Let's take a look at this guy, this whole balancing point of our data kind of idea. So let's go up here and take a look. Let's, let's make some room. So let's keep in mind, we'll presume we're just dealing with a sample. So X bar of 29.17. And then I'm going to just make some room here. And OK, so what do we mean by this principle here? So let's take a look. Again, let's pull back our number line, and we have our observations x. These are our ages in years. And if we take a look at this, if we want to kind of throw our numbers up on this number line roughly, we have a maximum value of 42. So let's say that this is, let's say that's 50. What's our smallest value here? 22. So let's say that something like that is 20. Uh, what if we pick somewhere in the middle here? What's that going to be? 35. So that's going to be something like 27.5. That's going to be something like 42.5. Again, I'm not too concerned about the scale. I just kind of want to get a basic idea as to what this number line looks like, so I can start throwing values up on it. So let's uh, let's start throwing the values here. Let's go say 22. So okay, I had two values at 22. Uh, let's presume that that's something like this. Let's just presume, right? These are like little weights. So there we go. We have two right there at 22. What do I have next? 24. Okay, maybe 24, something like that. That's one weight. 28. Okay, that's going to be just beyond there. Something like that's 28. And then what do I have? I have one weight at 37. So that is, uh, say something like that's 37. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit closer. Uh, 35 is there. There we go. Let's say that's 37. And then final one, 42. So there we go. There's my 42. So what we want to keep in mind then is where our mean was, where our arithmetic average was. And we said our average value was at 29. That is going to be roughly right there, right? 29.17. And then the way you can kind of think about this is, well, hey, yeah, 29.17, but we don't actually have very many observations even near there. Like, sure, we have this guy kind of near it, but we have a whole bunch over here, and then we have a few over there, right? In fact, we have this guy that's really large and nothing like any of the other values. And actually, even this guy is quite different than the other four values there. So in this case, the way you'd kind of want to think about this mean is imagine a seesaw. Imagine a teeter-totter, right? If you've ever been on a teeter-totter, there we go. We have our teeter-totter. This is our fulcrum such that the weight on this side and the weight on this side is perfectly balanced so that no side of this number line was tipping down. 
What this means, again, if you think, if you have the experience with uh, physics or have just done this being at the park as a kid, if we had a value way out there, being really far from the fulcrum, this one weight would actually cause this whole thing to fall down. Meaning having a weight way out in the extreme, just one observation, way extreme, would actually cause this mean to drift towards it. Because it would want to balance this seesaw, it would want to balance that teeter-totter such that it stayed flat. That is to say, through all this, our big takeaway is that our mean, our mean is sensitive to extremes. That is, even if all of our data set is packed nice and close to this mean, but we have the one extreme value, this one extreme value will influence the mean, will pull it towards it in order to balance the data set. So our mean is sensitive to that. And that's, that's a big thing to keep in mind as we utilize it, is that it can kind of, I don't want to say it's biased, but it's, it can be pulled, it can be distorted by these large outliers. If we go back to our other measure, our median, our median was not sensitive to extremes. Our median was just always going to be that middle value. It didn't matter how extreme the biggest was, our median would stay the same. So that is a principle that's unique to our arithmetic average to our mean. Our next descriptive statistic to talk about then is going to be our mode. And the mode, this is not one that we'll actually use too much as we carry on through the course, but what the mode is, is our most frequent, the most frequent observation. So which value do we witness the most? Now keep in mind, depending on the data set we're utilizing, we can actually have more than one mode. We can have a case where the same um, group of numbers appears the same amount of times. So the mode does not have to be unique. Additionally, we can have a mode for nominal or higher level data. That is, all of our levels of data can have the mode for it. Uh, if we take a look at our data set here, though, for our ages, well, the mode is just our most frequent observation. In this case here, it's just finding, okay, does anything occur more than once? So that is right. We can also have data sets without modes. If everything is a unique observation, we would have no mode in that case. Uh, in our case, though, we have 22 and 22 occurring twice. Every other point is unique. So we would say that our mode, the most frequent observation, is 22. So, okay, if we want to kind of compare so far different measures of position or location, we had a mode of 22. Our most frequent age was 22. We had a mean of, what do we have a mean of? Let's, uh, let's go back and take a look. We had a mean of 29.17. And we had a median, right? Again, the median was our middle. This was our 50th percentile, such that half were above, half were below. We had a median of 26. So, okay, we see how these values work out. In fact, what's really apparent in this is the distinction between these two, where we can say, okay, yeah, yeah, the median is the middle, median middle of our data set. And we really see that one principle of the mean coming to light here. The fact that our mean, our arithmetic average, is 29.17, that's because this guy was sensitive to these large values, which began to pull it farther to the right. The median, median is not sensitive to those large values, it's just the middle number, and so we see that in the distinction between these two values there. Taking a look at it, right, just saying, hey, the fact that my mean is bigger than my median, I know that I have some large values in this data set that is influencing this guy. Alternatively, if I had an average that was less than my median, so a smaller number here, I would know that in the data set I had some extreme small values that were pulling this smaller. So this comparison between mean and median kind of helps us to kind of have an idea as to where the extreme values may, may lie without visualizing the data. So that's our measures of position and location. 
altogether, we have looked at our percentiles, right? In the percentiles, that was percentiles, deciles, quartiles, as well as our median, just being the second quartile or the 50th percentile. We then took a look at the mean. This was the arithmetic mean. And then we finished up very briefly, not much to talk about with it, the mode, such that the mode was our most frequent observation. So these are the big ones for our measurement of location. The big two that we will utilize the most is going to be our arithmetic average and our different percentiles. The mode, I don't even think we'll really bring that guy up again after today. So yeah, we can know what it is. It will show up on maybe a few quizzes, but it will be very, very small in terms of in terms of future information. What we're going to take a look at next is our geometric mean. And for our geometric mean, we need to use a little bit of a different data set than our ages. And we'll talk about what the distinction here is between our geometric mean versus our arithmetic mean. So let's jump to a different type of data set to take a look at that. So for our geometric mean, this is going to be cases where our, where our x variables interact with each other in a multiplicative fashion rather than an additive fashion. So, okay, with our ages, our ages, right, one year to the next year, that's just adding. One plus one plus one. Sometimes we have variables, though, that deal with, deal with each other in a multiplicative fashion. So, for example, let's say we're talking about returns. So, and we can be a little bit more clear. Annual returns, and say these are annual returns on investment. And say that you had $1,000. $1,000 that you had invested, and over three years you earned, um, can't write, let's say over three years you earned 3% the first year, 5% the second year, and then we'll say you earned 4% in your third year. So okay, if we want to say, great, you've had three years worth of returns, let's work out what this would be. Well, what's the average return over this three-year period? Well, you might be tempted to say, okay, well, summation of this, what do we have? Three and four is seven, seven and five, that's 12%. Um, this is maybe a sample of return. So our X bar is going to be 12% divided by three, giving me an average of 4%. Right? And you'd be like, yeah, okay. That that wasn't too bad, but no, actually, that there would be wrong. This here would not be the correct return. And the reason why is that if you are getting these annual returns on your $1,000, these returns are compounding. That is, you're getting 3% on 1,000, right? So that is, right, if you want to kind of follow through what happens, you start off, with a thousand. You then had 1,000 and you earned a 3% return on it, so you now have 1030, right? So you have your initial thousand plus, still get that thousand back, but then you get another 3% on top of it. And then this 5%, well, this 5% isn't on the thousand. This 5% is on the 1,030, right? The returns are compounding. So now we would have. 5% return there, giving us, uh, what would that be? That would be 1081 and 50 cents. And then finally at the end, what would we have? Well, again, we are earning 4% on this 1081.50. So 4% on that would yield for us. So these compounding returns is what's going to necessitate a different formula to find out what our average return is. And so let's let's work out what that different formula would be. What we want to figure out is our geometric mean. And what our geometric mean is going to be is the product, right? So keep in mind we had for x bar was the summation of x all over n. In this case here, we have the product. 
which means that, okay, instead of going x1 plus x2 plus, we're going to be going x1 times x2 times on and on and on and on. So this is going to be the product of 1 plus xi all to the power of 1 over n. So, okay, instead of dividing by it, we're raising it to the 1 over nth power. So, if we want to work this guy out, we, we could do it, right? We would have 1.03 times 1.05 times 1.04. And you're like, whoa, 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 we're, why, why are we doing 0 0.03? Why isn't this 1 plus... 3%, why isn't this now 4% times 6% times 5%? Well, no, where did that 8 come from? 5%, right? Isn't that 1 plus 4% is 5%? 1 plus 5% is 6%? Why, why do we have these? Well, no, 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 no. Remember, we were talking about way back, a few videos ago now, we were talking that we could express this 3% as a number between 0 and 1, and so that would actually be the same thing as 3% or 0 0.03, 5% or 0 0.05, 4% or 0 0.04. Where does this 1 come from? Well, this 1 is popping up because every year we're getting our 3% return plus our principal back, right? So we're getting this full 100 or 1,000 plus an additional 3%. So we're getting the full 1,000 plus an additional 3%. On and on and on and on. Then we raise all of that to the power of 1 over 3, right? We're compounding over 3 periods. And what does that give us? 1.03 times 1.05 times 1.04. Well, that's going to give us 1.12 four, seven, six, right? All of that to the power of one third. So let's work that out. So all of that to the power of, that's gonna give me 1.0399. And if we wanna go on 0997, right? You're like, oh, so, here I calculated 4% or 0 0.04, and here I have a geometric mean of 1.03997. Well, okay, what we have to do, we just want the return. We know we're getting our principal back. So truthfully, our geometric mean in this case would be 0 0.03997. And now you're like, okay, really, Keith? Come on, isn't for all intents and purposes these two numbers identical? Yeah, yeah, they are in this case, right? In this case, we're dealing with relatively small values and we're not compounding over very long. We'll typically witness that we'll get pretty similar answers between the two. If we were looking over longer periods or we were having higher rates, say we had a 20% return one year, we would see a larger discrepancy between these two values. One thing that we will always witness though between the two is that if we were to try to calculate it both through arithmetic and geometric, the geometric average would always be smaller. We would always have a smaller geometric average. So that's one of our big takeaways and we can see that there, right? It's not much smaller in this case, but it is always going to be the smaller number. We can also figure out what our average return is another way, right? So as we saw, we can take the product of all of our returns and raise it to the one over nth power. We can also utilize another formula here. And what we could do is we could take a look at, uh, we could say, okay, my geometric mean is gonna be equal to my value at the end divided by my value at the start. Put some brackets around this all to the power of 1 over n. We have v1, this is the value at the end, right? This is our end value. 
v naught, this is our beginning value, and then same thing to the power of one over n, one over the number of periods we are compounding for. So if we wanted to work this out, we can go back up and grab the information, and that is in this case here, these values, these aren't res uh, with respect to these returns, it's respect to what we had for our returns, the rate at which our money grew. So our initial value, v naught, was 1,000. Our value at the end was 1124.76. So let's work that through. So we have 1124.76 all over 1,000 to the power of 1 third. If we work this out, we get again 1.03997. So again, this is saying we get that 100% return on principal plus an additional 3.997%. So we can work out our geometric mean as just 0 0.03997. This is truthfully, essentially 4%. Same as the, response, the result we got up here. So another way we can calculate this, if instead of knowing all of those values of return, if we just know where we started and where we ended up over how many periods, we can get the same result that way.